Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com. I hope you're all doing well. Hope your day started out okay. Mine has because I just had my caffeine and if I'm a little jittery, it's because I had two. I hope you guys are doing good. We're gonna talk about something today that's always been one of my favorites. It's the US Model 1832 Foot Artillery Sword. These swords were patterned after a French-made sword. The French had the Model 1816 foot artillery. And in the late 1820s, we actually sent somebody over to Europe to check out their design, and they patterned this sword after that one. A lot of our swords were patterned after European swords because they'd been around longer, they had more practice at it, and they had worked out most of the kinks, so we took their style and improved it. We didn't make the chicken sandwich, but we made it better. These were made uh, by the U.S. government, or for the U.S. government, from 1832 until 1862, so 30 years worth of production on these swords. During that time frame, they made 20,100 of them with the Ames Company. There were a few others that made them, but that was the major maker of them. You'll see some that were made by horsemen, several that were made in Europe and imported that look similar to this, but the one that most collectors appreciate and desire are the Ames made one, because Ames in uh, Springfield and later Chicopee, Massachusetts, were the premier sword makers. And this sword's kind of interesting because it's the first contract that Ames got with the US government. Lots later on, and but this one was the first one. On June 5th, 1832, uh, they got a contract to make 2,000 of them with N.P. Ames uh, in Springfield, Mass. He didn't have the capability at that time of making all of the handles, so he subcontracted them with a guy named Hughes, H-U-S-E. And they were in Newburyport, they made the handles, but they weren't as solid as the ones that they would use when Ames finally had the production. They realized that once the handle got knocked around a little bit, they came off easily. So they added the rivets like this going down the center of the handle, and that held the handle onto the blade itself. 19 inch blade, and it held it onto that blade. That's one thing that you look for on some of the uh, privately purchased ones is that they don't have those rivets. Also, some of the reproductions, be careful, because they do reproduce this one, don't have those rivets as well. The handle of the sword's really cool. It's a neat design. It's got the fish scale style designs in the center, uh, which not only made it look more attractive, it actually lets you get a better grip on the grip grip on the grip. <laughs> At the top of the grip, it always has that Union Eagle design, uh, a real cool looking eagle like that. The handle will oftentimes have the inspector mark. If you notice on the underside of the guard, on this one, uh, we've got MPL, MP Lomax, he was the ordnance inspector, and we also have the WS, and he was the inspector uh, that also inspected the blade. See this mark? And the blade should have markings. Sometimes they're light. They vary on how clear they are on these. This one, you can see the United States mark. You can see the uh, production date of uh, 1840. Hold that thought. 18, oh. I need new eyes if anybody's got some. 1843. Uh, so it's right in the middle of production. Remember, produced them from 1832 to 1862. Right in the middle of the production, which is a cool date because this sword could have been used during the Mexican War, and it also could have been used during the Civil War. So you've got uh, two possibilities in one. 19-inch blade. Blades are very distinctive on these because they have uh, the what's referred to as a fuller groove. These have three on each side. They were put in there to lighten the blade and make it more durable uh, because of the construction. Most of the time when you see these swords, they are missing the scabbard. That's because the scabbard 
was made of leather and brass on all of the Ames ones. There's some of the militia ones and some of the high grade ones that will have an all metal scabbard, but the vast majority of them will be like this with the leather and brass production. At the top of the scabbard, the brass actually has a little knob that sticks out. That is to facilitate the sword going into this uh, scabbard frog on the soldier's belt like this. That's a different one, but you can see what I'm talking about. And it's, uh, it's important to realize that early on, these weren't just for artillery. You see some that were used for infantry. They planned on using them for infantry, uh, for non-commissioned officers of infantry, and they did until that 1840 non-commissioned officer's sword came out. So that's why you see a few more than probably that 20,100. The uh, swords are interesting. The Confederates copied these, and they copied them for two reasons, I think. One, they look cool and they're fierce looking. But this style design during that time could have actually been used at more as a tool instead of a weapon. And it's reported several places that uh, because of that wide blade design that they used them to help dig out artillery emplacements. Uh, and if you had a horse that goes down and you had to cut the uh, harness off the horse, uh, you could do it quickly with this so they were used for multi, they were a multi-purpose tool as well as a weapon. Of course you could, if you were getting overran, it would be a deadly thing for up close personal combat. They're neat. I like them. I've got a few of the Confederate ones right now on the site. I've got this one. I've got, uh, I try to keep them because I like them and they always sell. They're, they're, <laughs> they're a good investment. Or to this point, they have always been a good investment for me because Everybody likes them because they're neat and they stand out. You can have a table full of uh, cavalry sabers. People are going to levitate to these just because, hey, that looks like something from Gladiator. The last contract of these was for a thousand swords. They put it in in 1861. Only 300 of those got delivered and they got delivered uh, in May 24th, 1862. So that's the last official delivery date for these. So, look for the blade markings. Uh, the dates vary. There's several good books out there where you can find out how many were made each year. Uh, John Tillman, my buddy up there, did a great book on Civil War uh, Army Swords. There's a whole section on these and shows a lot of the variations of the private makers as well as Ames. If you get a chance, go on the website. You can see this and compare it to some of the other uh, versions. I've got a Georgia made one right now. I've got a North Carolina made one copying these. So it's neat to kind of compare them and you don't get that opportunity quite often. I hope that you guys are doing well. I've had several people uh, say, are you still going to talk about Confederate stuff? Hell yeah, I am. Because these presentations are not anything more than sharing history. I will never back down from sharing history because those that forget their history are doomed to repeat it. I will never stop sharing what little bit I know with you guys, but I will also never stop sharing that I want you to be kind to each other. People are people. There's good people and there's bad people. And it doesn't matter your flavor, whether you're good or bad. It matters your heart. Martin Luther King said, judge me by the content of my character, not the color of my skin. And I think everybody should do that because there's some white folks out there that are trash and there's some black folks out there that are trash. And it doesn't matter your flavor. It matters your heart. And I will always do my best to share this history with you, but I will always tell you to judge that person on an individual basis. Do not judge anyone by just the color of their skin. Because there's so many people out there that judge people, white and black, by the color of their skin, and that's a load of crap. It's all what's in your heart, not what's in their mind about what's in my heart. I will always defend history. I will never be that person that says, uh, 
an entire group of people are bad, and I encourage you not to do that either because it's wrong. One of, uh, I have a foster daughter. The young lady is black. She is a wonderful person. She works hard every day, and she's gonna do really well in life. And I am thankful for her. She's good people, and good people are good people. It don't matter what flavor you are. I hope y'all have a wonderful day. I hope that when you get that opportunity that you are kind, remember that people care about you, and remember to give people the benefit of the doubt until you know. Catch you guys later. Love you.